Welcome to Firing Line. I'm Michael Kinsley of the New Republic magazine. This is a special edition of Firing Line devoted to marking this program's 25th anniversary. The first show was in April 1966. Firing Line is now the longest continually running public affairs show on television with the same host. That is, if you don't count The Tonight Show as public affairs. But Johnny Carson sometimes has substitute hosts, and in any event, Carson is retiring, while William F. Buckley Jr. goes on and on, as Margaret Thatcher once said she would. Whether <laughs> this is a record or not, whether it's a record or not, I don't know, but Firing Line has also had the same producer for a quarter of a century, Warren Stiebel. Not many people would have predicted in 1966 that anyone would be able to get along with Mr. Buckley or Mr. Stiebel for a quarter of a century, <laughs> let alone that both would get along with the other for all that time. But they did, and the viewers have been the beneficiaries. When Firing, well, excuse me, when Firing Line started, it was regarded by many television critics as almost unbearably contentious and rude. At that time, there was nothing remotely like it on TV, so argumentative, so ideological, so seemingly uncontrolled. These days, of course, you can flip from station to station watching journalists and politicians insulting one another at the top of their lungs on every channel. Firing Line, by contrast, now seems like an island of civility and reflectiveness in the sea of television theatrics. But it remains unique. Apart from Mr. Buckley itself, it seems to me, it has three admirable features. First, it proceeds through questions and answers, rather than random pontifications by journalists who are assumed to be experts on everything, as on, say, the McLaughlin group. Second, the questions can be tendentious. There is no stifling pretense of neutrality or objectivity, as on McNeil Lehrer or on Meet the Press. Third, the show ranges over a vast landscape of topics, not limiting itself to politics or public affairs. Nothing human is alien to Firing Line, as you're about to see. Mr. Buckley, where did the format of Firing Line come from? Because it was unique at the time. Well, it, it, came, um, uh, it, it came primarily from an impulse by its uh, uh, by RKO uh, and its uh, president to present the conservative point of view, uh, and uh, on the grounds that it wasn't being widely ventilated on television in 1966. Uh, but uh, from the beginning, it was stipulated, therefore, that it should not be an interview show. Uh, it should be an exchange of opinions, uh, and uh, uh, this this sometimes gets in the way when you run into prime ministers and people who say, you know, why are you getting into my act? And uh, one, one simply has to adapt. But that was the idea, really, to show that a conservative point of view could be, uh, could hold its own against um, uh, the predominant liberal position. It was estimated it would go 13 weeks or so, and, and then it was renewed rather unexpectedly for another 13 weeks and so on. And here we are. Well, we have a few uh, clips from the files. And the first one is actually the very first show in April 1966. Your first guest was Norman Thomas, a man who I assume needed no introduction back then, but today possibly does to some viewers. He was the head of the Socialist Party and more or less the dean of the American anti-communist left. And the subject of the show was the subject that dominated the 60s, Vietnam. Subject is Vietnam as it is. And, and what I want you to say is what you think you're going to do by escalating the war, what you mean by winning. <clears throat> and I'll tell you why we can't win, why we're fighting a cruel, inhumane war and a very stupid war. We never should have been drawn in it, and we should get out. That doesn't mean that we can decamp tomorrow at 10 o'clock, but it does mean that we can stop sending our boys to a country where <clears throat> the most recent uh, demonstrations have had at least a strong tinge of anti-Americanism in Saigon and other cities which are still <coughs> in the hands, supposedly, of our Vietnamese allies. What I am concerned is, is for a ceasefire, the beginning of negotiations, and other things that I'll talk about after I see what you mean to do. After you finish things. asking your question. Uh, go right ahead. Well, now they sliced that tape so that you that's got the... Me. That's oh, yes, I recognize that you got the last word. But the original idea of Firing Line was that every week you would debate a left-winger yeah. on some subject. Now, that has been abandoned over years. Did you run out of left-wingers or what? Uh, um... That would be one way to put it. Uh, the, no, the, the, the answer is, of course, that we, 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 pursue, uh, we, we pursue interesting questions, whether the positions are taken by a left-winger or a right-winger. But you've been on often enough to know that uh, we, we usually attempt to get somebody who defends the opposite point of view. No, Norman Thomas was, uh, uh, I, I've known an awful lot of uh, liberals and left-wingers in my life. I really didn't like him. Um, I debated with him very often. I think I didn't like him because 
he, uh, he always understood himself to occupy the entire spiritual stage. Anybody who was on the other side wasn't simply wrong, he was evil. Uh, and, and you got to taste a little whiff of that there. Uh, and, and of course, this led him into difficult positions, as for instance, when he opposed as a pacifist, which he once was, uh, uh, any participation by the America at all in the Second World War. He finally slipped on that. Uh, but uh, uh, he, uh, he was, uh, as, a, as a human being, he was admirable because he was so brave, so spirited. I last saw him going on a little tiny one propeller airplane after a debate with me in Pennsylvania to another debate with somebody else in Cornell. He was about 100 years old and blind. But uh, he was so, so, uh, so moved by his athletes in every situation that he, he felt that he had to coach the world on all subjects. Well, I think the next clip is also of someone I suppose roughly on the left, but you wouldn't accuse him of being, uh, having the moral hauteur of Norman Thomas. He was uh, Dr. Timothy Leary, who I guess you also have to introduce these days. He was a professor at Harvard who was thrown out for experimenting in LSD and was a major figure in the culture of the 1960s. The make love, not war guy. Yeah. <laughs> You uh, d diagnose as the world is actually the fake no prop television studio of New York City and uh, the United States today. The motto of our uh, religion is turn on, tune in, and drop out. Now this happens to be the oldest message which has been passed on by spiritual teachers and spiritual searchers for thousands of years. You've got to detach yourself from the situation. Our country was founded uh, on exactly that motto. Uh, Sorry, George III, we're dropping out. Uh, the Roman Empire fell as the American Empire will fall in the, in the near future from exactly the same motive. People turning within and then coming back to found their spiritual and their political and their economic life, not on the IBM uh, mass assembly line uh, society, but on the family, and the tribe. I mentioned to you earlier, Bill, in the dressing room that I consider myself to be much more conservative than you. You know, what strikes me about that clip is how incredibly close crop Timothy Leary is. This was very early on in the counterculture. A few years later, you had longer hair than he had in this clip. Well, he, he, he arrived in the studio dressed like the man with the gray flannel suit, and then he went into a dressing room and came out uh, dressed like a gypsy. Uh, uh, he, he was an amiable phony. Uh, he, uh, what, he, what he attempted to do was to simply to philosophize whatever biological or psychological impulses he was inclined to. Uh, he led people to Millbrook and fed them uh, LSD, and therefore decided that he should ph ph philosophize the uh, wisdom of taking LSD, of, of dropping out. Uh, uh, and that, as such, he became a little bit of a bore, but also kind of dangerous because he was infecting a lot of young people. And finally, they cleaned up his act, and he went back, and then, then he sort of reformed. He but, spent but some time in jail. He spent time in jail, yeah. And escaped from jail, too. One of the many things he, he got wrong, you can see in retrospect, is this business about IBM and computers, which in the 60s were thought of as aspects of totalitarianism as the giant anonymous culture, and of course it turned into, because of personal computers, aspects of the small, small, original, really part of the counterculture, in a way. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, now this next clip, I don't think we need to introduce even today. Our first wife I had to divorce, this is before the draft come up because she wouldn't wear our dresses long. Um, I think you remember this. This is headline news. It cost me $250,000. I'm paying $1,200 a month now in alimony. I paid uh, $96,000 in lawyer fees. Now, if this is not sincerity, I don't know what. Then I like to... Uh, uh, now, I have one more thing to tell you. The government is so out to get me because of who I am so that I can't donate to the work of Elijah, and I'm Elijah Muhammad. Man, we take a dollar and make $10,000 come from it. But you've written me, that Elijah me, Muhammad refused to take me, your money. Right, right. Let me say one thing to you. Let me say one thing. He's our own money, as a matter of fact, $100,000. Let me, let, me let me say one thing to you. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, this is actually a, a, a fascinating program because what, what had happened was that um, when he, was, uh, when he was processed by the draft board in Louisville, they saw this man who was uh, achieving eminence in the athletic world 
They didn't want to go to the Army. They wanted to fight and be a Louisville kid. So they said he was too stupid to pass the elementary uh, uh, intelligence test out of the Army. <clears throat> uh, then, when he became famous and joined Elijah Muhammad, they wanted to discredit him. So they revised their evaluation of him and said, no, in fact, he wasn't too stupid. So uh, in part, this program was to ascertain whether or not <clears throat> Louisville, Louisville board number one or board number two was correct. What's your conclusion? So, so I, I said to him, look, uh, the, the question is, if, if you are sincerely a priest, a Mohammed priest, then you are draft exempt. And so he said, how can you question my sincerity when I came home and told my wife that her, her dress was too short by Mohammed standards? And she said, no, it wasn't. And I paid us $63,000 a month. I paid us that <laughs> sincerity. <laughs> but <clears throat> what he proved really was a nimbleness of mind, which made it absolutely plain that the board <clears throat> was uh, uh, absolutely besotted in saying that, uh, <clears throat> that he was nimble enough. But uh, in any event, uh, uh, it was over and out. He was broke. He asked to be paid for his appearance in advance, uh, which, 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 which was done. And then he went around for months after saying that he had knocked out the champion not only in the ring, but also in a studio. Of course, the great tragedy of Muhammad Ali is that he is, he may have been, a, and obviously was extremely bright back then, and boxing has essentially destroyed his mind, <coughs> yeah, yeah. which uh, may raise troubling questions of libertarianism for you, but we won't take it up now. This, this uh, next thanks, clip, thanks. this next clip is from 1975, and it is Claire Booth Luce delivering a Bible lesson to William F. Buckley, Jr. Now, but I wish to go back to the heart of the question. Uh, the old uh, Testament myth of the Garden of Eden has aroused the ire of uh, women feminists for generations. The legend uh, creates, uh, God creates heaven in this, in this uh, legend. Uh, in the, in Genesis, he then uh, creates man. Man shares in the spirit of God. Now, man, man the male or man the synecdoche? No, man. The human God being. created Adam, mm -hmm. the first man. I'm talking about this legend. Uh, he then more or less leaves Adam to his own device, and Adam gets rather bored. And as an afterthought, God uh, creates woman, but he doesn't even create a boom like that. He lets Adam give birth to Eve, thus denying <laughs> to woman in this uh, uh, few chapters of the Bible, of the Old Testament, uh, the right to be the first mother. She's not even the first mother. Adam's her mother. And then it's the legend. Uh, uh, goes along, uh, the end of it, the rather cruel and dreadful end, is that Eve bears the burden of having brought sin and death into the world. Adam, in the most ungallant fashion, <laughs> uh, tries to blame the whole thing on me. The woman tempted me. I, oh, he, skulk, he streaks for the bushes gets himself in the bushes, hides from God, and then when God hauls him forth, blames it on the woman. Now, there's your typical male chauvinist right <laughs> from the beginning. Well, some of these issues never go away. Just the other day, the New York Post had a big headline, Cardinal O'Connor says God was a man. <laughs> According to Claire Booth Luce, God was not only a man, but he was a male chauvinist. But do you agree with her exegesis <laughs> well, there? Well, uh, 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 Claire Luce was, was uh, a professionally a feminist, feminist and, and personally one of the most seductive uh, women uh, I ever I ever met. I knew her and loved her, and I was one of her two uh, eulogists when she was um, when she was uh, uh, buried. The uh, sh she was uh, wonderfully combative uh, and and extremely skillful. She would uh, pluck out uh, episodes and uh, weave around them in her marvelous uh, 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 with her, her marvelous narrative powers. Uh, uh, the, the point that, that she wanted to stress. And here she was trying to explain the origins way back then of the presumption that the woman is a subordinate creature. 
and, and rather effectively. And by the way, I don't, I don't think it's all that easily debatable, neither the myth nor the reality. I'm glad to hear you describe Claire Booth Luce as seductive because I once got into enormous amount of trouble with the, your side of the political spectrum when I was at Harper's Magazine and we ran a headline on a profile of Claire Booth Luce that said, Claire Booth Luce from courtesan to career woman. And we got accused of calling this, this goddess of the right wing a prostitute, which is not what courtesan means at all, really. But she called up and said she was delighted to be, uh, <laughs> she said, I wish I, was, I wish I was still young enough to make it possible or something like that. <laughs> No, oh, she was a wonderful, wonderful singer, wonderful, wonderful company, and I, I miss her terribly. Well, now, this next clip is of someone who is actually much more famous now than when she first appeared on Firing Line, and this is 1975, I believe. For years now in British politics, this word, you must use it, consensus, has reared its head. You must have a consensus. Uh, it's, a, it's a word, again, you used not to use when I first came in politics. We had convictions. And we tried to persuade people that our convictions were the right ones. And it's no earthly good having convictions unless you have the will to translate those convictions into action. But politics <coughs> was more, if you had convictions, than a matter of multiple maneuverings to get through the problems of the day. I often think when you're going for consensus, so often it means that those who believe, as I believe, tend to give in to the left wing and who steadily move further and further left. Now, I am in politics because of conviction. But I know that the one of the last election, the previous election, was fought in Britain on what I think is one of the most damning sentiments ever uttered. And it was by the predecessor to Mr. Callaghan, uh, Harold Wilson. What the British people wanted, he said, was a bit of peace and quiet, anything for a quiet life. Now, you know and I know that this is the great drag on democracy, that people will say, does my voice count? Can I do anything? And therefore, they leave it to a tiny, well-organized minority. Now, you ask, have people learned? Yes, they are learning that if you do leave it to that tiny, well-organized minority... Unpleasant things happen. Unpleasant things happen, and you then recoil from that. Now, I absolutely love that clip because that is a laboratory pure example of something we had never heard of at the time, which we now know very well, known as Thatcherism. Right. Conviction, <clears throat> not consensus. Yeah. You know, no, you're, you're absolutely right, and, and of course she electrified uh, uh, Great Britain when she finally assumed power and stayed in for longer than anybody else in this, uh, in this century and was eventually kicked out, but then we're talking about society that also kicked out Winston Churchill in preference to Clement Attlee. So these, these things do tend to happen. But here, here she, she showed that metallic quality which she absolutely needed in order to prevail, for instance, against the unions which were running Great Britain at, uh, at that time. Uh, as recently as a week or so ago, Anthony Lewis in the New York Times said, all she is is a pest as far as the British are concerned. If she were just a pest, you wouldn't have bothered to say it. Well, the fact is that she has an enormous constituency because they think of her as an important historical figure who made a, a real difference in Great Britain. They have, this clip also demonstrated what Private Eye, the British satire magazine, used to call her gamma ray treatment, those, those eyes. Yeah, right. I want to ask you about something she said. She, she was very contentious of the idea expressed by Harold Wilson that the people want peace and quiet. Now, it seems to me that one of the complaints among conservatives about Mrs. Thatcher was that she's not a conservative, she's a radical. And that, in fact, the notion that people want peace and quiet and don't want to be hectored by politics all the time is actually a quite conservative idea. And the fact that she didn't realize that after 12 years is one of the things that led to her downfall. Conservatives, to be conservative, need to be radical from time to time, as they were in 1776. Well, all right, let me ask you about something else about Mrs. Thatcher. What I, what I admire about her, even as a liberal, is that she had the courage of her convictions and she was willing to ask people to sacrifice to achieve her goals. There was very high, she, she balanced the budget, to take one key example, in, in Great Britain. And that is one thing that seems to me that the leading conservative politicians of this country, Ronald Reagan, especially George Bush, have really not done it. They have gone, Michael, they have she, 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 con out, she, she controlled the House of Parliament. Ronald Reagan does not control Congress. But they, they have both displayed, well, Ronald Reagan certainly doesn't control it now, but even, no, at, did, even at his peak, he was never willing, if it was a question of using up his political chips, risking his popularity, 
to achieve one of his alleged conservative principles. He tended to go to save the chips. She would go for the principles, and it paid off. Yes, well, the, the, all kinds of questions have to be uh, answered to illuminate your point. Uh, the, tax, the rate of taxation under Mrs. Thatcher did not decrease as sharply at the marginal rate as it did with Reagan, and uh, our rate of economic uh, progress vastly exceeded Great Britain, in part because he didn't succeed in lowering it sufficiently, notwithstanding her hold on Parliament. All right, well, but these, these, these are simply modalities of, uh, of conservative progress. But there's no question about the fact that she was a historic figure. I well, I, I wouldn't challenge that for a moment. Now, the next, the next clip is two historic figures from the United States, one from 78, one from 79. Is this the last clip? This is the last one. Yes, there is a problem. Sensitivity to the Panamanian people, uh, to what they want, to their pride. I agree with that. But also, on our side, is the responsibility we cannot abdicate to protect and make sure that the canal remains open to all shipping and that it is there for the defense of this hemisphere and of our own nation. Now, we have to face the Panamanians in a negotiation not because we've been threatened that they're going to cause trouble, because I say that this is one of the first things that should have called off the negotiation. When they threatened violence, I believe the United States should have said to them, we don't negotiate with anyone under threat. If you want to sit down and talk in the spirit of this Pierre, let me help you on some of this. One, I think it's a nutty idea to fool around with the social security system and run the risk of the people that have been saving all their lives. We made this social security trust fund solvent, and it's solvent. So that's not, a, it may be a new idea, but it's a dumb one. On the uh, on the question of the question of the INF treaty, on the question of the INF treaty, I told you all these European leaders are for it. I'm for it. The president's for it. The Joint Chiefs are for it. And I don't see why you can't say, hey, if it's verifiable, it's a good idea to get rid of 1,600 warheads from the Soviet Union for 400 of ours, and then go on and do what I've said: work on conventional forces work on chemical weapons. I put the treaty on the table in Geneva to ban chemical weapons. It's fine when you're outside, carping, criticizing a president, criticizing, and it's different. I found it is very different when you're in there having to make the tough call. Now, those, those were two historic debates. Uh, the first, because uh, the question was, did every conservative in America need to be against the Panama Treaty? or was there room for another opinion? Uh, I maintain that there was, and, 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 and I, I debated with Mr. Reagan on that point. Two things became clear. Number one, that you could still be as anti-communist as anybody and think that the Panamanian Treaty was a good idea, tactically. Secondly, that Mr. Reagan, on his feet, uh, in a protracted two-hour debate, could take extremely good care of himself. Who was right and who was wrong in retrospect about the Well, I, I, I think I was right, and I think it was obviously right, and uh, uh, I tease him about it from, from time to time. The fact of the matter is that everything that was predicted would happen if we passed the treaty did not happen. In fact, I go so far as to say, if we hadn't, if, if he hadn't taken his position against the treaty, he wouldn't have had the nomination because the conservatives were very much galvanized on that issue. Number two, if the treaty hadn't passed, he probably would have lost the election because the reaction in Central America would have been tumultuous and would have given a lot of, off a lot of smells like Vietnam, which people did not welcome. The, uh, our relations with Panama over the course of uh, the recent history has been one long irony. In fact, relations with Panama were extremely cordial during the Reagan years, something for which Bush was put on the defensive during the 1988 campaign. And then in very, very early on in Bush's term, Noriega turned very briefly into public enemy number one, even though we had had him on the CIA payroll shortly before. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was complicated, but of course the, the guy who dominated the Panama at the time, whom I got to know slightly, uh, uh, ruled with, yeah, he ruled with an iron hand uh, and, um, uh, uh, and was not himself corrupt. As a matter of fact, he, li he lived a, a rather reclusive uh, life. Uh, on, on, the, on the Bush business, this was the very first appearance of Bush as a candidate uh, on firing line, and uh, all the candidates were there, and everybody was saying, well, he's a wimp. Uh, uh, he not only showed, for instance, in that particular uh, segment 
but he wasn't. But they also saw that he was capable of a certain amount of waspishness. I don't know whether you caught it when he referred to Governor DuPont as Pierre, but he had spent his entire lifetime uh, persuading people his real name was Pete because he didn't want to remind people of his sort of aristocratic uh, uh, background. That, now, that line we subsequently found out because it was revealed in a book by Roger Simon had been fed to Bush by his campaign manager. Call him Pierre, and that, that will absolutely make him dissolve and hit him hard on Social Security and I and that. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that Roger Simon on Firing Line actually told that story, mm -hmm. and it points out the total artificiality of the current uh, political system that Bush could script that line in advance. The, the people covering that campaign and covering that debate of yours knew it was scripted in advance. It worked. It nevertheless worked to drive Pete DuPont out of the campaign. He'll be known for that for the rest of his life. And Bush's image was turned around, even though everyone knew that it was, a, it was phony, essentially. Yeah, that, that's why I think the, the notion of uh, stand-up debates uh, can be uh, defended. But the trouble is that it's... I've got to cut you off, Bill. All there is is time to say... Happy birthday, and by the time of the 50th, you'll be as old as Norman Thomas. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Next week on Firing Line, William F. Buckley Jr. talks with Mideast experts Rita Hauser and Daniel Pipes about the new climate in the Middle East and whether or not peace is possible in that region. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support was provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, L. John Polite, Jr., and the Friends of Firing Line. For a printed bound transcript of this program, send $3 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Indicate the subject of the program and please allow three weeks for delivery. William F. Buckley Jr. offers 20 years of firing line guests from the 60s to the 80s. For 1995, you can receive this companion book by calling 1-800-872-8188. Credit cards are acceptable. Or send a check to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205.